Good morning. Thank you for coming on Zoom and watching us here with everyone in quarantine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my PowerPoint about BRAF. Okay. So um, what BRAF essentially does, we kind of talked about this, but let's talk about what happens when you have a mutation in the BRAF gene. When you have a mutation in the BRAF gene, then it affects how it actually works. And so in melanoma, instead of um, waiting for its turn to signal the cell to divide, it actually causes the BRAF um, signal to happen all the time or, or much more frequently. And so when this happens, it causes the cell to divide and grow out of control. Um, and so here's kind of a, a visual picture of how that happens. Um, on the normal cell side, the signal comes in, BRAF um, tells the nucleus to make the cell grow and the cell divides normally. In the BRAF mutated um, melanoma cell, the signal comes in, it uh, generates multiple signals or signaling, pulse signaling one after another after another, and then that tells the cell, unfortunately, to create many, many additional cell growth um, orders. Um, here is a picture of the MAP pathway. Um, you can see how um, BRAF sort of fits into the pathway here. You have BRAF, you have MEC, you have ERK. Um, originally, when um, clinical trials were being done with BRAF inhibitors, um, they were seeing some progression um, or resistance um, to the BRAF inhibitors. And what they found is that it was because the cells or the body found, found this BRAF part of the chain and it would activate MEK. And so now we have drugs them together where you're getting BRAF blockade, but also MEKade. Um, and it makes for a much more um, sturdy or solid um, blockade picture. We have better responses that last a little bit longer um, and also subsequently have less side effects and toxicities, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. Okay, why is it? There we go. Um, so here's some facts about BRAF. Um, so mutation in the gene causes melanomas to grow and spread. About 40 to 60% of all um, cutaneous melanomas have this BRAF mutation. Um, interestingly, um, things like ocular melanoma and mucosal melanoma, they tend to not have the BRAF mutation, but they may be more likely to have something called a CKIT mutation, which actually is a completely different pathway of growth, um, which we're not going to talk about today. But it's something that does have a specific inhibitor that is for their specific type of cancer as well. Um, if you have a mucosal or ocular melanoma, um, CKIT testing is something that may be done to your tumor specifically. Um, but back to cutaneous disease, so 40 to 60% of all cutaneous melanomas have this mutation. 80% um, of these BRAF mutations are actually V600E, um, which is just an alteration in the protein at the, the it's a, like a valine for, I don't know what the E is, I probably should, but um, it just switches the, the protein. Um, five to seven percent are a smaller proportion are V600K. The BRAF inhibitors that are actually on the market right now um, work for both V600E and V600K. Um, if you do have the BRAF mutation, um, your oncologist or physician will a lot of times refer to this as BRAF positive or BRAF mutated. If you do not have the BRAF mutation, um, you may hear your physician say that you're BRAF wild type or BRAF negative. Um, what happens when you inhibit the MAP, path, MAP pathway with BRAF inhibitors? So um, essentially, without getting too technical, the drug um, affects the mutated BRAF gene and blocks the signal through it. So um, Dr. Kirkwood's mission. So if you block the pathway, it shuts the BRAF mutated oncogenic signaling, and then it can't grow. So then it leads to cellular death. Um, this also changes the tumor microenvironment, we now know, um, so around where the tumor actually is to be more favorable for immunotherapy for future treatments as well. Um, the interesting thing is if you um, inhibit the BRAF gene alone with the BRAF inhibitors, um, it shuts down the oncogenic signaling through the MAP path pathway, but the cancer cell tries to figure out a way to bypass it. And so that's kind of where I'm blocking the MAC pathway came into play. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, 
about 50% of um, folks that had progressed with the BRAF inhibitors in the past um, did so because of reactivation through the MAC pathway. Um, and so we started blocking that pathway as well. Um, so this is just a visual of like where the actual BRAF MEC pill works in the MAP kinase pathway. You can see um, this has, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but this has um, an example of one of the drugs or two of the drugs that actually are responsible or are BRAF inhibitors. Um, you can see that um, it blocks this inherent um, pathway. So how do we prevent um, the reactivation of the MAC pathway? I talked about this already. We block both BRAF and MEC. Um, this ends up being more effective, um, actually quite significantly more effective. The response rates increased, um, progression-free survival increased, and interestingly, it was less toxic. Um, we almost, at this point, don't typically use BRAF inhibitors alone. We most of the time, I would say almost all of the time, use the BRAC mac um, combination. Um, so how do you test BRAF? Um, we need tissue, tissue to do this test. Um, the tissue can come from various sources. It can come from your primary melanoma if it's deep enough. Um, it can come from a wide excision. It can come from lymph nodes that have tumors in them or biopsies of metastases like cutaneous metastases, lymph node metastases, lung and liver. Um, if we can get a tissue sample of it, a lot of times if it's a metastatic lesion that we're trying to biopsy that you need a core biopsy um, to really get enough tissue. Um, these are things that the pathologist will use to test. There are various testing methods that um, can be done. Um, some of them are branded. I'm not gonna talk about them in this setting, um, but it's something that your oncologist will typically choose the pathology to use and then choose the testing method that they want to employ. Um, who do we do the test for? So this is something that is approved by insurance for stage three and stage four patients. Um, and so routinely in our office, this may not be true everywhere, but in our particular office, we will routinely ask for BRAF testing on stage three and stage four patients. Um, part of this is because obviously these are treatment options for those folks, both in an adjuvant and metastatic setting. We use this in both arenas. Um, but also because this test does take sometimes up to a week or two to get the results back, sometimes because we have to um, request the pathology to be sent from another institution or, it, you know, sometimes the actual tissue block can be difficult to get. So in order to save time in the long run, a lot of times we'll ask for this when we initially meet a patient, even if we don't intend to use it until a later time. Um, we also, as Dr. Kirkwood kind of alluded to in his introduction, will use this for stage two patients, actually in clinical trial um, settings. And um, there are several national clinical trials right now that are testing um, the use of both immunotherapy and the BRAF inhibitors um, in stage two patients. So in the context of a clinical trial, um, stage two patients will get tested as well. This is not something, at least at this point, that is routinely done. Um, in a regular practice setting, um, just because one, it's not covered by insurance, two, at this point, stage two patients don't have a routine adjuvant um, treatment. So um, unless there are really specific um, reasons to do it in a stage two patients, a lot of times it's just stage three and stage four. Um, it can be done at any time. It doesn't have to be done originally when you get your you know, diagnosis of melanoma, you can do it 15 years into your journey. Um, so don't worry that, you know, if you didn't have it originally done, that it can't be done. It can always be done. Um, again, I talked about it's covered by insurance in the above settings um, and that there are varying modalities to, to actually test for BRAF. So here is just a slide that shows um, the three different approved combinations of BRAF MEC. Um, the words are so very fun to say. Um, a lot of times, you're, at least in our center, we'll re refer to these drugs by their generic name, which is the name that's not in parentheses. Um, the branded name is actually in parentheses so that you can, well, actually, I switched them in this one. That's weird. Um, but the branded names um, are the ones that are easier to say. So there's Vemurafenib, also known as Zelbaraf, um, and Cobimetinib, which is Catelic. 
There is dabrafenib, which is also known as tafinlar, and trametinib, which is known as mechanist. And then the other combination, which is newer to the market, um, is the encarafenib and benimetinib, which is braftovi. Uh, Braftovi, Mectovi. Um, each of these combination have their own set of side effects, um, some of which are, are generalized across the board for BRAF MEC inhibitors, um, some of which are very specific to each grouping. Um, for example, with Dabrafenib and Trametinib, we see a lot more fever um, than with the other combinations. Um, that's not to say that you don't get them with the other combinations, but it's much more prevalent in the, in the Tap and Lauren mechanist folks. Um, whereas in um, the Braftovi Mectovi or the Ankarafenib Benimetinib group, um, we'll see a lot um, more, um, in my opinion, joint pain, um, muscle pain. We see a little bit more light sensitivity and ocular symptoms um, I've observed with that group. Um, in the um, Vemurafenib and Cobimetinib group, we tend to see a lot more sensitivity to sunlight. Um, I remember when we first started doing clinical trials with those drugs, we would have people that would go outside to get their mail and spend, you know, two minutes outside in the sun and have blistering sunburns. So each one of these has a little bit different um, toxicity profile. And we have the privilege now of being able to choose um, the specific drug combination um, that is right for the patient. So if we have somebody who is, you know, has a lot of GI toxicity at baseline, we may not pick the drug combination that causes a little bit more of that. Or if we have someone that has already had a lot of um, ocular um, toxicity from other drugs, we may not pick um, the combination that causes you know, those things to happen. So we're, we're in a, a really great place right now because we have a lot of options. Um, here is a, a slide that just shows the general side effects of BRAF MEC inhibitors, this specific to more of the BRAF side. So when you call in with your side effects, um, some of them happen because of each drug. So when you call and you're like, I'm having fevers, we know that if that's happening, um, it's most likely because of the BRAF part of your treatment. And then we can dose reduce that part of um, the regimen and leave the MEC inhibitor at the same dose and vice versa. Um, so some examples of BRAF um, toxicities would be rash. Now in um, in the drug combination of BRF MEC inhibitors, we see rash on both sides. Um, the difference is when you have a rash from the BRAF inhibitor, it looks more like hives or a macular rash. Whereas in the next slide, you'll see the rash from MEC inhibitors is more of an ac acneiform or an acne-like like pustular rash. So when you call, that's one question that we would actually ask you because it helps us distinguish which of the medications we need to alter. Um, we have seen some hair loss. We've seen fevers, like I said, especially with the tafenlar, um, nausea and vomiting, um, some diarrhea. Those can be managed a lot of times with over-the-counter medications. Um, one interesting thing that's a little bit different in the management of toxicities between the immunotherapy with you know, the PD-1 inhibitors and, and IPI um, is that we have the ability to use some low-dose steroids um, to treat some of these toxicities if they're very severe, but yet not interrupt um, the dosing of the BRAF MEC inhibitors because we know that even giving a little bit of steroids still allows these drugs to work. So it doesn't counteract the effects um, or lower um, the effects while on BRAF MEC. Um, we've also seen some elevations in liver functions that we've had to dose, um, adjust for. Joint and muscle pain, dry skin, and callus formation. That's actually um, a side effect that um, is very underdiagnosed. Um, a lot of folks will get this sort of keratinization of the skin or like really sore feet and hands, and that comes actually from the calluses forming um, because of, of the BRAF inhibitor. Um, so here's alternatively, I don't know why it says question mark, but some um, of the toxicities for the MEC inhibitors. Again, the rash is more of an acne-like rash. Um, so it also can cause um, cardiac symptoms. And this is why something that we keep track of. Um, some side effects or um, symptoms of cardiac abnormalities would be weakness, dizziness, swelling in the hands and feet, um, but also because we're going to be checking the ejection fraction and the wall motion and sort of how much tension is put on the heart. And that's an extremely important um, thing that we monitor. Um, the MEC inhibitors also, like I said, can cause some ocular um, adverse events like light sensitivity, blurred vision, double vision. 
it's something that we may ask you to go see your ophthalmologist for a dilated eye exam for. Um, we have had to discontinue MEK inhibitors um, because of some of these toxicities. Um, it can also cause pneumonitis, much like immunotherapy. We don't see that a lot, but it has been documented um, where you get this sort of shortness of breath and dry cough, which funny, sounds a lot like COVID-19. Um, so it's something that, um, and this is sort of a timeout aside, but if you're on BRUF MEK inhibitors and you're on immunotherapy like PD-1 or IPI, and you do get shortness of breath and dry cough, you really should call your oncologist. There are a lot of things that we can do to kind of determine whether or not these are from your medication um, or whether they're from the virus. One of the things that's a little bit different is that you don't see fever in patients that get pneumonitis typically from immunotherapy or the, or the BRAF mech treatment. Um, another thing that's really nice about BRAF mech is if you hold those medications, a lot of times that will go away. Um, we also have seen elevated blood pressure from the mech inhibitors as well. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna address very quickly a couple myths. This section will go pretty fast. Um, is BRAF inherited? We get that question kind of a lot. Um, it's not inherited. You cannot pass the BRAF gene to your children. It's an acquired mutation. In genetic terms, that's called a somatic mutation. Um, it occurs spontaneously at a cellular level. So it's caused by essentially cellular damage for various reasons, but it is not an act, like not a sex like linked gene, so it is not inherited. Um, sometimes it gets confused with BRCA, um, but this is an extremely separate thing. Um, even though BRAF mutation can be seen in other tumor types, if you have a melanoma and the BRAF mutation, it doesn't mean you're at risk for getting those other cancers that have documented mutations, just so you, that you know. So having a BRAF mutation in a melanoma does not make you more likely to develop, like say, a head and neck cancer that also has, you know, we've seen BRAF mutations in. Um, BRAF, uh, one of the myths is that BRAF only occurs in younger patients. Um, this is also not true. Even though BRAF mutations are seen more commonly in younger patients, it also can be present in older patients. So everyone should have testing if you have stage three or four cutaneous melanoma. And then another myth that we've kind of come across is if I have BRAF mutation, then for sure my melanoma is going to come back because it's more aggressive. This is not necessarily true. There's a lot of things that go into determining your recurrence risk. Um, ulceration, Ashley actually covered this really well in her topic. Um, being BRAF mutated does not mean that your, your risk is so high that your melanoma is going to for sure come back. Um, but also being BRAF wild type doesn't mean that your melanoma will, will never come back. So we look at, there's a big broad picture at what kind of determines that to happen. Um, so BRAF is not a reassurance nor a um, quote unquote death sentence either. Um, it is really, um, it's really something that we can use to treat your melanoma. So if you have any questions, I'm going to cover that now. Um, also, um, I'm also the um, Ask an Expert person for AIM. Um, a lot of the people that I actually see on the participants probably watch me also. Um, you can reach me um, through their website um, and also ask an expert at aimandmelanoma.org and also on my toll-free number. But I'm gonna take regular questions now.